Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Misha Thompson with the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Um, I think as many of you may know, Sunday marked the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I'm happy that you were able to join us today to discuss racial and ethnic profiling, an issue that is critical to efforts to eliminate racial discrimination, um, which is also, unfortunately, a prevalent issue in the 56 North American and European countries that make up the OSCE region. Uh, Helsinki Commission Chairman Senator Ben Cardin, Co-Chairman Elsie Hastings, and other commissioners began efforts some years ago to combat intolerance and discrimination in the OSCE region. Now, five years later, the OSCE has an established tolerance unit that publishes an annual hate crimes report, has three personal representatives to address these issues, and has developed numerous initiatives to address prejudice and discrimination. The issue of racial or ethnic profiling within the OSCE region is one that is common to many OSCE countries and has been raised repeatedly. In particular, the Commission, U.S. government, and organizations such as the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and Human Rights First have called for a response to the profiling of Roma, Muslims, persons of African descent or blacks, and other groups in Europe and in the U.S. And it's often been raised in the context of combating hate crimes. The OSCE's High Commissioner on National Minorities has convened experts to discuss the issue of multi-ethnic policing, which resulted in numerous recommendations. Specifically, and I quote, the experts recommended that measures should be taken to ensure that police enforce the law in an impartial and non-discriminatory manner, which does not single out any particular group, for example, by engaging in racial profiling. Additionally, the report called for diversity in law enforcement. Despite these efforts, the issue of profiling is not going away, and one could argue has become more challenging to address amidst government efforts to fight terrorism. Today our panelists will discuss the situation in the U.S. and Europe and international approaches for addressing the problem. I am especially pleased that our guest from Spain, Rosalind Williams, was able to adjust her schedule at the last minute to be here to speak with us about her historic case. And I would also like to welcome Rachel Neal, an expert from uh, OSI, who has worked across Europe on this issue, and Jamil Dakwa, who has raised the U.S. case at the United Nations and within the OSCE. Uh, Ms. Williams. Thank you, um, Misha, and I, Dr. Thompson, I welcome this opportunity to share my experience with <clears throat> all that would like to um, be aware of it. As was pointed out just now, um, the idea or the concept of racial profiling, rather than uh, being decreasing, is increasing. I am a citizen of Spain. I'm also um, a citizen of the United States. Uh, city of the United States by birth. I was born in New Orleans, and as of the a year and a half uh, age, I, my parents took me to San Francisco. So I was uh, educated in San Francisco, resided there, um, went to college there. And through my college in San Francisco, I first went to Spain on a junior abroad program, and met during the, that year I was there the person who was born in Spain, is a Spanish national and white, my husband, um, whom I married in 1968. 1968, I, prior to going to Spain, uh, I was working in New York at the UN for two years, and decided to return to Spain and established it after we were married Christmas time as my re permanent residence. And at that time, upon marrying a Spanish national, acquired by marriage Spanish nationality. I mention this because this is important as background for how what I did and am doing was actually carried out. All right. What exactly happened? What happened was uh, December, on December 6, 1992, I was traveling with my family, with my husband and my son, to uh, regional capital, regional city, close to Madrid, two hours north of Madrid, Valladolid, by train. <clears throat> As I stepped off the train, I was approached by a gentleman who turned out to be a plainclothes policeman who asked me for my ID. Now, as a Spanish citizen, as all Spanish citizens, you are required to carry with you at all times your national identification card, which I always have done. 
since 1968. All right. Uh, since I had never ever been asked for my ID, um, and I noticed that no one else was being asked for their identification, I asked him just very spontaneously, why? At which point, both my husband and I asked him, um, why? He said, because we're looking for people like her. And we asked him, what do you mean like her? And my husband said, because of the color of her skin. He said, yes, we're looking for people because there are lots of illegal immigrants like her. At which point, um, as was asked at our meeting just recently in New York, what was my reaction? My reaction was I was totally dumbfounded. I was without words. Um, to make a very long story short, the next day, oh, I must say parenthetically, that December 6th is a national holiday in Spain and is the called the National Day of the Constitution. So uh, when I filed, I filed a complaint the next day with the local police station. And once we were back in Madrid, because it was a four-day weekend, um, I sought legal assistance because I knew I would have to go to this town perhaps to be in court, et cetera. And what we were looking for was a specialist in constitutional law because what I was questioning was the constitutionality of what had happened to me as a Spanish citizen. And at the same time since, at that time, in 1992, Spain had supposedly the most modern constitution in Europe, I, again, was dumbfounded. I, I said to myself, how on earth can a country that has such a modern constitution actually employ racial profiling? Make a very long story short, <clears throat> the lawyer <clears throat> was not pro bono, as is the case. Such a, such a system does not exist in Spain nor is there a Spanish version at that time of the American Civil Liberties Union. Therefore, this was an effort which um, we had to support with personal funds, all right? So from 1992 to 2001, the case was taken through the Spanish court system, and each time it was uh, rejected, we appealed. So this happened a total of between four and five times. After that, <clears throat> after it was thrown out, it finally reached a dead end which was called the Constitutional Court. And I'm sorry, the uh, Tribunal Constitucional, yes, the Constitutional Court. Um, it was rejected saying yes, in essence, citizens of Spain could be stopped for their ID based on the color of their skin after nine years. So um, I was found, I didn't look for, but found uh, by uh, two organizations in Spain. One was Women's Link uh, Worldwide, which was working directly with the uh, Open Society Justice Initiative. And through these organizations, the case was taken to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which ruled after deliberating uh, it was presented in 2006. The actual case was considered and deliberated 2000, 2009, 2008, 2009, and a decision was arrived at in, gen in July of 2009. 2009. <clears throat> All right. The suggestion was that I be offered a public apology on the part of the government in Spain that reparation be provided, and that measures be taken on the part of the Spanish government to put in place um, laws, et cetera, that will prohibit such an incident as I occur, as I experienced. I, after that, received um, invitations on the part of several very high-level authorities to meet with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, expressing their apologies on the part of the government, expressing an interest in seeing how some reparation could be made, and also expressing the fact that there were certain measures in the form of laws being considered on the drawing board um, but on the part of the government. Yet, the actual, um, I would say, suggestions that the uh, committee had 
made, put forth, have not fully been met. I think that's about it in a nutshell. I stayed under the time limit. Judy's good. I'll just swing this way. Thank you very much, Misha. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm having the DC allergies. Uh, my name's Rachel Neild. I'm a senior advisor with the Equality and Citizenship Program of the Open Society Justice Initiative. When we use the term ethnic profiling, uh, what we describe is when law enforcement target people because of who they are rather than because of what they have done. This is a form of discrimination that is illegal under international and under European law. It is humiliating and hurtful to the people and to the communities who are thus targeted. But it is also ineffective and even counterproductive law enforcement. It sparked major riots in a number of European cities. It's clearly eroding trust in law enforcement and alienating communities whose help's much needed, both in addressing current terror threats to national security and in generally addressing public safety issues in communities everywhere. Yet while we're quite familiar with this issue in the United States and, and in my original home country, the UK, in most of continental Europe, the question of law enforcement discrimination or ethnic profiling has gone unrecognized until very recently. The Open Society Justice Initiative launched our project in this area in 2005 to try to address this gap. And it was indeed Rosalind's case um, precisely that drew our attention to it. Uh, and we made us realize that when one looked, there was a lot of evidence but no quantitative data and very little research being done to understand the full dimensions and the dynamics of ethnic profiling. So our project works on three broad strategies. We advocate for new legal standards and policing policies. Um, we conduct research to try to find out what is happening and draw greater public and political awareness to it. And we are also working with police and communities to identify and promote good practices in policing diverse communities um, where there is interest and will to collaborate. Our research has produced some of the first quantitative data on police practices in a number of EU states, and I left some of our reports on the table outside. They're also available on our website. Um, the results where we've been able to generate quantitative data have been the same. Visible ethnic minorities are far more likely to be stopped and questioned by the police. We found rates that range from three times more likely, and this is what's called an odds ratio, if you are Roma, Black, Arab, whatever, you are three times more likely to be stopped than a white person, to rates up to 14 times more likely to be stopped. In fact, we did some research in Moscow where the peak disproportionality was 21 more times likely to be stopped if you were, in that case, non-Slav um, than if you were a Slavic Russian. These are extremely high disproportionality rates, much higher than we see in the US or the UK, where the top rate is about 8 to 1. <coughs> Yet, where we've been able to get data on the outcome of these police actions, with only one very, very specific exception, the ethnic minorities have been no more likely to be detected offending than the majority group. In fact, in a number of cases, the ethnic minority groups are far less likely to be offending than the majority group. In addition to the pejorative and inaccurate stereotypes about minorities and offending which underlie the use of this profiling by law enforcement, two further factors today are driving ethnic profiling in the European Union. The first is a reliance on stereotypes about religion and the propensity to violent extremism that underlies many European counter-terror practices. In May last year, we published this report, Ethnic Profiling in the European Union, which presents evidence of the use of ethnic and religious profiles in a range of counter-terror practices by police and intelligence services. We did field research in five countries for this report and used data that was already available from the UK. We've identified a range of counter-terror uh, counter powers and tactics where law enforcement is relying on religious and stereotypes and stereotypes about national origin more than they are on intelligence. 
from counter-terror stops and searches, mass ID checks, raids on Muslim places of business and places of worship, to data mining using profiles focused on religious and ethnic criteria, to efforts to detect people who may be in the process of radicalization, or that is becoming the so-called homegrown terrorist. We found evidence in all of these practices that they relied heavily on stereotypes about religion, about national origin and ethnicity. Yet we found no evidence that these practices had helped to detect terrorists. Indeed, what is worrying, and analytically I think kind of speaks for itself, is the evidence that profiles, because they are predictable, are open to evasion and substitution. When we look today at this country and others, Jose Padilla, Richard Reed, and now Jihad Jain are the manifestations of this possibility of, detect of evasion or substitution. So people of different origin and appearance can simply be substituted for those who fit the profile. To be effective, both ordinary policing and counter-terrorism must be based in solid intelligence and not in prejudice. The second factor driving ethnic profile in Europe um, that has increased in recent years is the aggressive enforcement of immigration controls. In some cases, politicians have actually set numeric targets for police to stop and search people, detain them and deport them. Um, unsurprisingly, the police response to this is to go out and stop and search visible minorities. Indeed, it's hard to imagine what else they would do in response to such targets. In a Europe that is rapidly becoming increasingly diverse with second and third generation native-born peoples of immigrant origin, these policies are driven by outdated assumptions about ethnicity and nationality, and they impose a deeply unfair burden on those second and third generations and indeed on all legal immigrants into the EU. I will end, as we've been asked to be very brief and have time for questions, um, by noting that although this is a disturbing picture, there has been increasing recognition of the issue amongst European non-discrimination bodies and also to some degree, I don't want to overstate it, but within police forces. Um, in our project, we focus not just on research and litigation, but as I said, have been working to identify um, and promote stronger norms and good practice in law enforcement. We've had partnerships with a number of law enforcement agencies um, and undertaken local pilot projects. Um, and we were very pleased uh, we had particular success in one area which clearly demonstrated that you can in fact address ethnic profiling in a manner that reduces disproportionate stops of ethnic minorities but at the same time increases the efficiency in which police use their powers. Basically in this area the hit rate on police stop and search, that is the number of times they detected an offence, went up three times because they were thinking about who they were stopping and why and not using stereotypes. So I would just wrap up by saying I think that much remains to be done. We need to still gain far greater recognition of the issue. We need to strengthen legal norms prohibiting discrimination in law enforcement. And we need to broaden knowledge and adoption of good practices. But we're continuing to work in this area. We're finding more and more partners and residents on the ground in different European countries. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions that you have on any of these topics. Thank you. Let me first uh, thank uh, Misha and the Commission. The Helsinki Commission has been um, instrumental in um, uh, basically putting the spotlight on human rights violations in, uh, in the United States as well as abroad, and more importantly, connecting the dots between the different global trends uh, in the OSCE region, including the US uh, and Canada, as the two members uh, outside the European continent. Uh, so I'd really like to, to say thank you for the, for, for the, for the efforts, particularly around uh, the role that the Health Commission played around the U.S. review before the third committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, the Health Commission has issued a statement uh, 
the time when the, the committee uh, made the recommendations and also later on uh, sponsored a resolution that was very important to, to provide support for the uh, International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, it's also important that the timing uh, coincides with the, with, with the International Day Against Racial Discrimination and, and uh, 50 years ago with the Sharpeville Massacre, which, which basically is, is the, the reason why uh, the, the world every, every year on the 21st commemorates or remembers this day as International Day Against Racial Discrimination. About 66 people were killed uh, and hun hundreds were injured when um, the South African uh, apartheid uh, regime uh, cracked down on peaceful protest at the time. So I think it does have uh, this important context in how th this, this massacre and gross violations of human rights in, in that context um, leads us to, to think about how do we um, continue to improve the situation. While we, we know that much has happened since then, both in South Africa and in the United States, but we have to think of how much we have to go further in, in promoting human rights and ending racial discrimination. Uh, the historic fight against racial discrimination and racial bias in the United States continues and has perhaps become more challenging in the 21st century. Although fewer de jure or forms of discrimination remain in existence, de facto racial disparities continue to plague the United States and curtail the enjoyment of a fundamental human rights by millions of people who belong to racial and ethnic minorities. Policies and practices that appear race neutral, but disproportionately restrict the rights of freedom of people of color are difficult to challenge, and establishing their discriminatory nature in the public consciousness and among policymakers in an uphill battle. Racial profiling by law enforcement and the correlate criminaliza criminalization of people of color provide one such example. Despite overwhelming evidence of its ex existence, often supported by official data, racial profiling continues to be prevalent and a egregious form of discrimination in the United States. Both the, the, the Democratic and Republican administrations have acknowledged that racial profiling is unconstitutional, socially corrupting, and counterproductive. Yet, this unjustifiable practice remains a stain on American democracy and an affront to the promise of racial equality. Since the September 11, 2001, new forms of racial profiling have affected a growing number of people of color in the U.S., including members of Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities. The Obama administration has inherited a shameful legacy of racial profiling codified in official FBI guidelines and a notorious registration program that treats Arabs and Muslims as suspects and denies them the equal protection of the law and even the presumption of innocence uh, in the United States. As noted by Representative John Conyers, since September 11, our nation has engaged in policy of institutionalized racial and ethnic profiling. If Dr. Martin Luther King were alive today, he would tell us we must not allow the horrific acts of terror our nation has endured to slowly and sub subversively destroy the foundation of our democracy. Equally troubling has been the federal government's encouragement of unprecedented rates of immigrants, particularly Latino communities and workplaces by lo local law enforcement in cooperation with federal agencies. These policies have unjustly expanded the purview of an undermined basic trust in local enforcement alienated immigrant communities, and created an atmosphere of fear. Uh, according to recent reports by the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights and the Southern Poverty Law Center, inflammatory and anti-immigrant rhetoric has led to a dramatic increase in hate crimes against and, against and racial uh, profiling of Latinos. The report that the ACLU and the Rights Working Group released last summer analyzed the prevalence of racial and ethnic profiling on the federal, state, and local levels. The report found that racial profiling constitutes one of the today's most significant challenges to equality. While the U.S. Constitution prohibits racial profiling and the international community has defined racial profiling as a violation of human rights, profiling constitutes to impact millions of people in African, American, Asian, Latino, South Asian, Arab, and Muslim communities. All over the country, racial and ethnic minorities very often are investigated, stopped, frisked or searched based exclusively upon who they are and what they look like or what faith they practice without any identifiable evidence of illegal activity. 
The disproportionate rates at which racial minorities are stopped and searched, in addition to the often high concentrations of law enforcement in minority communities, continues to have a tremendous impact on over-representation of minorities in the American criminal justice system. The report was submitted to the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as part of the follow-up uh, 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 process to the committee review of the U.S. Uh, progress or U.S. implementation and compliance with the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Unfortunately, the report represents only the tip of the iceberg uh, and a variety of additional examples of widespread nature of racial profiling no doubt exist. Uh, last fall, in in response to the report that we submitted and in response to the, uh, the follow-up report that was submitted by the Bush administration, literally in the last days of the Bush administration, the UN Racial Discrimination Committee sent a letter to the Obama administration expressing concern about the US government's lack of progress in addressing racial discrimination. The committee urged the US uh, uh, to pass legislation prohibiting racial profiling and to end immigration programs that fostered profiling. The committee's observations uh, still being uh, not uh, studied by the Obama administration and no, uh, no response was submitted to the committee. As an Illinois state senator, President Obama broadly championed state legislation to end racial profiling and as a U.S. senator, he co-sponsored the End Racial Profiling Act, which was first introduced in 1998. He appointed an Attorney General, um, uh, Attorney General <coughs> Eric Holder um, to head the Justice Department and Eric, uh, uh, Attorney General Holder has stated that racial profiling is not a good law enforcement and, is com and he said that his Justice Department is committed to combating the practice of racial profiling. While the Obama administration has taken some steps to address, address racial profiling, such an opening an investigation into the anti-migrant practices of Arizona's Sheriff Ar Arpaio, harmful policies from the previous administration still persist. For example, the Obama administration is continuing the Bush policy of allowing the federal government to aggressively transfer substantial responsibility of civil immigration laws to state and local enforcement, resulting in the increased profiling of people of color suspected of being undocumented immigrants. Most, of, most notorious among these in initiatives is the 287G program, which has been criticized for encouraging the harassment of both immigrants and U.S. citizens, particularly in Latino communities, further the mar marginalization of already vulnerable populations. Moreover, in the wake of the recent events such as the Fort Hood shootings and attacks and the failed Christmas Day bombing attempt, uh, some have placed fear and bigotry over due process and basic human rights. Earlier this year, the Obama administration announced that citizens from 14 nations, almost all predominantly Muslim countries, with the exception of Cuba, will be a subject to increased scrutiny security measures. These measures will not make us safer and will only serve to further stigmatize broad groups of people. The report, which, is, uh, uh, which includes this, uh, very detailed recommendations, calls for national legislation to, to end uh, racial profiling particularly with the emphasis on uh, all covering all kinds of uh, uh, profiling and without no exception that would, that would allow the government to use them in order to profile people based on stereotyping. Uh, the report also come up with a recommendation to review all policies and programs and to repla replace them with more effective and fair policies that prohibit the use of race or national origin or religious affiliation um, for, for in, in the practice of racial profiling. And it also calls for the suspension and end of the anti-discrimination, uh, end to the anti-immigrant enforcement programs, such as 287G. Uh, the report also includes an important recommendation that deals with uh, transforming uh, the Civil Rights Commission into Civil and Human Rights Commission that will be able to monitor effectively human rights violations, particularly a practice like racial profiling. Uh, it also includes uh, recommendations about anti-profiling training, trainings that are lacking in the, in the law enforcement <coughs> agencies uh, to bolster in oversight and transparent complaint procedures and uh, more importantly to end some of the or to revisit some of the guidance that have been issued by the former administration including the, the Justice Department guidance on the use of race in law enforcement agencies. Thank you.
Um, thank you, and uh, I'll actually, we're going to begin, in a sense, the Q&A and discussion uh, part of this briefing, and uh, as the moderator, I think I'll take the privilege of asking some of the first questions. Um, I actually wanted to start with uh, Mrs. Williams in, in really asking, um, I think first, during this time, I think during uh, what, uh, this close to a decade, in, in, or actually over a decade, in which you've... Uh, I think been waiting um, for this I think situation to be addressed. What has been the response I think of the Spanish public, and um, and I think also how have things I guess either changed or not changed um, in in specific regards to being uh, to profiling in Spain. And I'll preface that by saying I um, visited Spain a couple of years ago now. Um, and actually spoke with a few NGOs that were uh, charged with responding to persons who believed they had um, experienced racism, whether that were hate crimes, uh, uh, et cetera. And the one thing that I was actually told during that time is oftentimes people didn't actually um, report incidents of uh, discrimination, so whether that was housing, um, uh, some type of violent hate crime that was committed against them, etc. And and part of the reason was is they were afraid to actually go to the police to to say anything. Um, and and it was in direct relation to I think uh, uh, being racially profiled and um, in some cases because people are legal actually being thought that they might then uh, be arrested or, or something of that nature. So I think the first thing we should um, actually point out is that number one to answer the second part of your question first, the, there has been an increase in the last 17 years, or 18 almost since I began this case until now, there has been an increase in racial profiling throughout the country, not only in Madrid, not only in Valladolid, where this happened to me, but in other areas of the country. Now, there has been an increase also in the multicultural uh, aspect of a multi-ethnic aspect of the Spanish popu population. All right. So, in essence, there has been an increase in illegal aliens and uh, Ill illegal immigration. Nonetheless, as uh, Rachel has pointed out, uh, racial profiling does not solve the problem. You cannot find certain, um, say, segments of society through racial profiling. In my case, most people in Spain, um, more or less, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was received and requested to meet with one-on-one um, -on -one with high-level officials. And high-level um, met the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, uh, the second in charge of the Ministry of the Interior, which is equivalent here to Homeland Security, and I received a letter from the Minister of Interior. In all three cases, there was an expression of an apology on the part of the government, in the name of the government. In all, in all cases, I think all of them, well, I didn't meet with the Minister of the Interior, but with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation and the uh, person in charge of UN Affairs, Director General of UN Affairs for the government, for the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs was more or less, uh, they were all surprised at my perseverance. More or less surprised that we would <coughs> proceed to do this for as long as uh, it happened. I think the most important thing, as you mentioned, in Spain people do not really understand their um, privilege as a citizen of a democratic society, nor their responsibility. Now at one point, one um, attorney who helped me find the specialist, in con to the attorney who's a specialist in constitutional law pointed out to me, he said, this happened to you in Spain as a Spanish citizen, but you're proceeding to fight it as an American. Now, I think most people either give up because it is laborious, it's unpleasant, it's humil the actual incident was humiliating. Number two, you really don't know what to do. So in my case, um, I was actually uh, able to ask a friend of mine who was a journalist 
American Bureau Chief for Associated Press, when I told her what had happened, she suggested I go to a journalist in the area where the incident happened, who was a colleague of hers. This particular gentleman suggested that I go to the police <coughs> station and file a complaint. When we went to the police station, the policeman who was in charge of taking complaints would not take it. Would not take it. And at one point in time, as I mentioned to you earlier, my husband is Spanish from Spain. And I never call him darling, even though he is. I turned to him and I said, in Spanish equivalent, well darling, I guess we have to go and have lunch and come back with a notary public to file a lawsuit. Because I knew, according to Spanish law, you can file a complaint, and as long as it's notarized, it's a legal document. So, uh, to make, to answer your question, I'm doing a roundabout way. Most people give up, most people don't know what they can do, and most people are afraid. Now, there's another, um, you might have seen in our bios, in my case, I'm an artist, a practicing artist, and a curator of photography. Therefore, I work for myself. I don't have to worry about not maybe being fired from my job, or not being hired, or people in a, say, a coffee shop at work not wanting to sit next to me and eat with me. <coughs> so in reality, I'm more or less a free spirit. Right. I've lived in Spain for 40 years. I've lived there under Franco. Spain is a very new, it's only been a democracy a little bit more than 30 years in this recent epoch of democracy for only 30 years. Therefore, I um, felt that it was my duty and my privilege to be able to at least try to see if what had happened to me could uh, more or less be at least fought. Does that answer your question? But you actually make me want to hear more. <laughs> So, um, but actually, I'll, I think we'll go on to Ms. Neal for just a second and um, actually raise the question of what, what I guess, similarities and differences have you found between looking at just that Spain and other countries within Europe? Um, and, and I think in several regards, I think uh, first this idea of, um, you know, if, if this happens to someone, how it is they even, um, I guess, report the issue, um, you know, first at the local level, um, then if you need to use the courts, you know, how that actually works and so forth. And, um, and I think later we can get a little bit more into, you know, specifically what you've done in terms of training and some other things. Sure. Um, I think one of the things to think about looking at these issues in Europe is the nature of migration. So you have some countries like France, England, to a degree, the Netherlands and Germany that have had fairly large scale migration for quite some time. There are some important differences between them in terms of how they nationalize people or not. Um, and then you have other countries in Spain and Italy really stand out at the moment who have been historically um, net sending countries, not receiving, but in the last 10 years being on the Mediterranean coast and part of the EU have really faced a massive influx, as Rosalind mentioned. And the numbers are quite staggering, actually. Um, I frankly don't actually recall them. I think it's like five million people have gone to Spain in the last <coughs> decade. Some are going home now, but um, Spain has become, from being a very homogeneous country, a very multi-ethnic country, at least in the large urban centers. Um, and the response to this, unfortunately, and not <coughs> surprisingly, has been some degree of, of racism and xenophobia, um, and really deeply ingrained prejudice in law enforcement. Um, you hear a lot, oh, all of the crime is committed by immigrants. Um, well, there was actually crime in Spain before immigrants arrived, <laughs> surprisingly enough. And it was in Spain where our data found um, much lower offending rates, actually, amongst migrants. Um, than, than the Spanish national population. Um, the current situation that has, as Rosalind knows, has gotten considerably worse because of the economic crisis. Spain's doing quite badly. Um, but, it's really, but also because Zapatero, the president of Spain, had a fairly positive um, immigration policy and actually opened nationalization to many people faced a very strong political backlash against that and was now clamped down. 
So in Spain, they're actually calling on the police to round people up. However, they're also doing this in France, where you don't have a massive wave of recent migration, where you've got very long-standing um, multi-ethnic society and a very deeply held notion about Frenchness that includes the overseas territories, as they call it. And they're also, with the right-wing government this time, that are numeric targets to round up immigrants. So while there are, are sort of national distinctions, there's, there's a broader dynamic um, of, of law enforcement discrimination driven by the three factors I mentioned, the stereotypes about who commits crime, um, anti-immigration, and now counter-terrorism. And um, you see the responses to this. We were probably most uh, aware of the riots in France in November 2005. But these are actually, we don't see it in our press because they're not necessarily quite as big, but there are uh, public disturbances in cities, in inner city areas going on all across Europe. In Denmark, in the neighborhood in Copenhagen, um, just over a year ago, there were riots with cars set on fires provoked by a police stop and handcuffing of an elderly Pakistani gentleman. Um, I was just in Belgium, and the Belgian police were describing areas of Brussels and love as no-go areas for the police. Uh, and you hear this um, a great deal in, in countries all, all over the EU. So, and actually, I'll just let you comment because I, I really have this feeling as she was talking that you were also visualizing some US <laughs> cases in cities. And so I'll, I'll let you respond. And then I think we'll go ahead and open it up to the audience. Sure, and um, I, I also want to acknowledge my colleague Jumana Musa who's sitting oh, your here. Oh, your mic. Uh, Jumana Musa is sitting here and from the Rights Working Group uh, that, that we worked together on putting together the report. And obviously, the, what we are seeing, and it's also uh, a lot of information that was gathered by local organizations working at the state level, that this uh, phenomena of uh, targeting and profiling immigrants, migrants, uh, because of what they fear, uh, different, the brown people, uh, black people, of course, that, that is something that is prevalent and is, is, a, is a actually something that's happening across the board. Uh, and what we, are, uh, what we have been raising concerns about those kinds of programs where you have uh, national, federal government uh, providing uh, and, and deputizing uh, local enforcement to engage in the in those kind of sorts of policies of of, uh, of uh, in enforcing civil immigration laws that is not historically has not uh, uh, been the traditional role of local law enforcement. So instead of uh, maintaining this, this trust between communities and the local state level, uh, which is in, imperative and important for. For any success, law enforcement and in, in, in the challenges of you know all kinds of crimes and so on, you having uh, diverted resources to to actually uh, breaching this kind of trust, and you're seeing that there are people who are uh, being set in a in a moment of siege. And I think a lot of people, th thousands who demonstrated yesterday, <coughs> have, have also sent that kind of message. Uh, it, it is also a matter of what it, what is the national. Uh, what's the federal government doing about that? And I think, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we have heard uh, that the, this administration, the Obama administration, is very committed to fight racial discrimination and racial profiling in particular. Uh, we have seen two investigations launched in particular looking at racial profiling, the, the Sheriff Arpaio in Arizona and the East Haven, uh, another investigation that was opened in, in December of last year. But yet we have not seen uh, the kinds of uh, comprehensive review and revisiting the, the previous administration policies, and particularly allowing law enforcement to use race and national origin in uh, conducting their, uh, their work. And uh, for example, the, the FBI guidance from 2003, uh, sorry, the Justice Department guidance from 2003, that specifically uh, addressed the issue of the use of race uh, by law enforcement agencies have, have, have many loopholes and uh, that, that actually carved out some sort of an exception uh, for the use of racial profiling. For example, national origin, religious appearance or religious uh, background would not be part of the uh, prohibited 
basis for uh, conducting uh, law enforcement work. Uh, it doesn't apply to local law enforcement. Uh, it doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. It doesn't have uh, the, the, the enforceability in terms of knowing that the, the agencies or the, uh, the officers who will be violating that will actually be punished for, for engaging in racial profiling. And then we have the more, more recent uh, uh, policies, particularly on the, the FBI guidelines that were issued by former Attorney General Mukasey, which clearly provided, given, gave the FBI uh, kind of an authority to use race as long as it is not the only factor. Of course, the race will not be the only factor in most of them, if not 99% of the times. So as long as the race and, and uh, national origin is not the only factor, uh, that was uh, given as a, as, a, as a matter of an authority. So we are still hoping that the Obama administration and Attorney General will, will revisit those guys. We know that there is a task force that is reviewing the DOG, uh, Department of Justice guidance from 2003. Uh, unfortunately, this process hasn't been as meaningful, as transparent as we would like it to be, uh, to allow input from civil society, from NGOs, from, from all sorts of directions, based on the experience that we had over the last seven, eight years. But clearly, uh, you know, we are we are seeing some movement is not the movement that we would like to see um, in putting in behind the, those kinds of policies that really uh, was were counterproductive to what the administration wanted to achieve. And c certainly, the 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 failed attack in Christmas Day um, had all those kind of uh, examples of showing that this is a case where it was not about you know profiling and stereotyping the entire community, whether the people coming from Nigeria or Muslims or, or Arab, uh, uh, but rather looking at the individual behavior and, and really engaging in a, in a uh, old-fashioned police work, in policing work. Look at the criminal behavior and see whether there are any suspicions there of any wrongdoing, but rather than sticking a profile to the entire community, uh, whether people coming from a particular country, and then you have those situations where now organizations are evading those kinds of profiling, uh, and and you know you heard the Jane uh, Jihad, Jane or Jane Jihad example of even women or white uh, not not appearing anyway. Suspicious law enforcement have been also involved in so so all sorts of uh, things. So I think we we have to look at those things in in context. And I truly was thinking about all those examples when 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 I read and when heard the 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 summary of the report, the OSI report. I'll say, if anyone wants to uh, ask questions, you can use this microphone here. Um, I'm actually going to bend it around and, and you can come to the front. Um, and just to allow people to have time to come to the front. Um, I'll, I'll uh, also ask uh, Ms. Neal, do you, I think, also mentioned in your recommendations the report a focus on uh, behavioral, um, um, behavior actually as a mechanism also for uh, trying to find uh, persons who uh, maybe potential terrorists or, or committing crimes, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and actually how or if that recommendation is being used in the countries that you've worked in. Um, we specifically call for a reliance on intelligence, um, both counterterrorism and policing, um, and even immigration. The good intelligence is the basis to identify behaviors that give grounds for reasonable suspicion that somebody has actually done something. I think I mentioned very briefly in my opening remarks that we did have one exception where we found a minority group was offending at a greater rate. Um, it was in the city of Girona in Catalonia um, where we were working with the police to introduce stop forms. And the one group we found with a higher offending rate um, of the minority groups we were monitoring was Roma women, Romanian actually. Um, what was happening was there was a lot of shoplifting going on in a certain downtown area, the downtown area with lots of shops, and they had a pattern where in the afternoon women would go in these shops with um, large shopping bags lined with aluminum foil to evade the metal detectors. And so the police were going in and they were stopping and searching. Women they found with large shopping bags which you know, looked like they met this criteria. Um, sadly, this appeared to have some ethnic degree of socialization and they stopped a lot of Romanian women doing it. 
But what was interesting to me about that one was if you interrogated why the stop was happening, what was going on, it wasn't per se because they were Romanian, it was because they were in a time, a place, based on a crime pattern in that time and place. And I think when we look at effective policing, that is what you're going to see. The problem is a lot of policing isn't actually necessarily done to catch people doing wrong things. It's done to impose control on populations. It's done to maintain a certain form of social order. And it's done to exert power and to swap countries. I think that's what we see happening a lot in France at the moment. There is a huge problem around Paris in the outlying areas with um, youth. Their unemployment rates are far, far higher. They're stuck in these get sort of basically ghettos. Um, and there is just an appalling level of confrontation right now going on with the police. And you really need to address them because using aggressive stop and search to say we're in control um, is simply sort of throwing matches into a tinderbox, frankly. Really, they need, they need decent jobs and they need education, but they also need the police to back off and to stop socializing more broadly this attitude that they're all potential criminals and about to do something. On the behavior, so I'm, I'm a little bit cautious with the idea of behavioral profiling because um, I think it's something where most of us are not clear as to what we're talking about. Um, there is a lot of interest in behavioral profiling and there's a lot of marketing of behavioral profiling, a great deal of it coming out of Israel. Um, some of it is quite interesting. I actually was uh, invited to observe a training at Shibol Airport, um, not in the airport, where Albert went through, he went because he was in transit, but in the um, area that surrounds Shibol Airport, there's a train station right from the train station into the plains, and that area is patrolled by Dutch military police, and an Israeli private company was training them to pay for the profiling and we watched them for half a day and it was actually it was it was fascinating. They asked me not to talk publicly in a lot of detail about what they were doing, um, but it really was very interesting and it was very behaviorally focused. It was uh, it was about looking for people who weren't following normal patterns. That said, there's other people who are out there talking about behavioral profiling and then they put out these these indicators and they're things like wearing a heavy overcoat when it's too hot, mumbling, wearing rose water. And what you see is a lot of what these supposed behaviors are, are in fact proxies for religion. And it's not about behavior at all, it's another religious stereotype. So I think that before one sort of endorses behavioral profiling as something being better than ethnic or religious profiling, you need to see what the actual practice is and what the outcomes that it's producing are and be clear on that. Question coming from the audience. We're not talking about loud mouth, but we're recording this, so I understand. First, I apologize. I came in late, and so I didn't hear um, Ms. Roslin's uh, presentation. I just wanted to follow up on Dr. Thompson's um, uh, first question. How have, has the government of Spain implemented the decision of the Human Rights Committee that they made, that the committee made in 2009? What, what are they doing? What's their reaction? Well, the reaction, I... The reaction has been that, um, as I mentioned, there were one-on-one -on -one meetings. In other words, um, to use my words, um, I, I, not publicly, but in these private meetings, expressed my gratitude for solidarity. <coughs> but I made a point of pointing out that, in essence, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations suggested that I be advanced, I be given a public apology. Why? A public apology is an expression on the part of the government that they are not in favor of this. This has not happened. I have not received a public apology. There has been expression on the part of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation to see, to investigate reparations. Nothing has happened, really. And from the point of view of the, there are two laws now that will be, that are on the drawing board, that have been presented to, new laws that have been pre presented to the um, 
Council of Ministers, this was told to me by, in a, again, a one-on-one -on -one private meeting with the second in charge of the Minister Ministry of the Interior, Homeland Security. And um, those laws, in reality, are, they could be effective, but it might take four or five years if they manage, because they have to go through a certain bureaucratic process and be presented to the equivalent of Congress, in other words, the Parliament. And they have to pass. So it's, it's a nice gesture. There have been very, some very significant gestures, but in my opinion, um, nothing has really been concrete. In other words, we haven't arrived at closure according to what the committee has suggested. But Kelly, you can help me or you think you agree with what I'm, what I'm saying. So I think perhaps it was, it was, it was a very heady um, experience on my part, but at the same time, um, I was told that by the, the, the person in charge in the, of UN Affairs within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, he had gone as far as he could go. And that I did receive the letter, which in essence was, was a two-page, very, very, very cordial, very polite letter from the Minister of the Interior with very explicit explanations of what the Spanish government is doing. Um, and I was told I could do whatever I would like with that letter. In other words, I could have a press conference and mention that. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not in Spain to do the homework of the government of Spain. I'm a citizen defending, asking the government to defend my rights as a citizen. And as far as I'm concerned right now, that has not been done. Um, I guess mine is, is half comment, half question for comment. Um, I mean, I think one of the things as you talk about the Obama administration's policy, you know, our issue is that the Obama administration's actions actually allow for so many of these programs that these federal programs that are encouraging racial profiling because the guidance, as you mentioned, does not include profiling based on religion, based on national origin, and then has large exemptions for borders and national security. So that in many ways, those exceptions sort of swallow up the rule and allow you know programs that use state and local law enforcement and immigration. They allow things like the TSA policy that targeted everyone with a turban, which is now turned into a bulky clothing policy, which targets everyone with a turban um, and other religious clothing and things like that, and so I think, you know, and then you have the FBI guidelines which don't even meet the very low bar of the DOJ guidance in terms of protections, and those are all things that are currently in place and not, at least the FBI guidelines, actively being looked at for change. And so we find that extremely problematic, but what I would like to get some discussion on is some of the discourse we've seen recently by the government when you get to things like behavior profiling, things like that, is who it applies to. And I say that because in terms of, where many of these things come in, it's it, when you start to criminalize immigrants and you start to talk terrorism. And we saw recently the man who flew the plane into the IRS building um, causing death and, and you know saying that uh, violence is the only answer and he's politically motivated. We saw the man who went to the Pentagon and shot you know a couple of the guards and they were both treated as not terrorism. That this was somebody who was an isolated actor, they were I know, mental illness, they, all the list of things that were not terrorism. And so what that appears on his face is that the definition of terrorism then is no longer about the act, but it's about the actor. And so I, I would love if you could sort of encounter that and how the sort of criminal and terrorism narrative uh, you know, plays into who the actor is when acts get described and how that then sort of affects the larger question. Um, I think in this debate, in this discussion about uh, what is uh, what is permissible law enforcement action and what is not. I mean, there is also the polit politics of this issue that uh, influences everything that happens. And, and they, when you start to see people uh, uh, taking it in, into the realm of uh, fear mongering, this is when it becomes really much more difficult to conduct uh, constructive and open debate and discussion about what is permissible, what is not permissible. And just to give an example of how uh, that is, is really kind of, the, when you have a certain 
enemy, concrete enemy that you're fighting, it be kind of that's the argument goes. It becomes a little easier to to tackle or to to deal with uh, when you don't have a specified enemy. Uh, uh, then it becomes like more difficult to be isolated individual cases, and in, in that in that. And that is why we see that a lot of it's easier for, uh, you know, um, in many ways, it's not only the U.S. space, it's something that happens in many other countries, is to uh, stereotype and to, uh, to categorize and stigmatize uh, and victimize one large group of people uh, rather than uh, doing the more difficult but more effective way of looking at, what I said, individual behavior, not looking at behavioral uh, profiling, but I was more alluding to looking at individualized uh, kinds of suspicious uh, rather than group-based suspicious, based on cultural uh, uh, appearances, cultural uh, traditions or, or behaviors uh, and so on. So I think that that's what it's really getting us to, which is that you have uh, uh, the easiest way to react to those kinds of actions saying, look, it's all the people who would practice religion would likely to, to commit an act of terror or act of violence. And so instead of really focusing on those small group of individuals that may have, uh, uh, they have the potential of doing that, let's just go in against the entire group of people who practice religion, who practice Islam, and for that matter, they are the ones <coughs> who are the enemy and the potentially the ones who are going to do that. And, and, and so you have, you have a really, entered into a realm which is very dangerous in, in, in labeling people, putting uh, borders around them, alienating them, making them feel that they are not trusted no matter what, uh, whether you are a citizen or not citizen, you are white or black, uh, the, the, your, your religious affiliation would make, uh, uh, will, would, will speak uh, on your behalf and you don't have even the, the, the presumption of innocence at, at any stage of the life. So, uh, th that's one of the things that it said. Act. The other thing is that the vagueness of the policies. When you have, uh, you know, what's the definition of uh, of terrorism? You have, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you have have looked at that in different directions. You have, uh, you know, when you create a um, uh, certain broad definition of what is terrorism, what is not terrorism, and how does that fit into people's action. Uh, it, it creates an, another layer, so that it's easier to to, to to paint in a broad brush uh, the the entire population rather than specifically addressing the the on again on individual uh, level for those kinds of uh, suspicions. The the FBI um, guidelines that, that Jumana mentioned briefly uh, have that uh, problem as as they they do create. Uh, um, space for FBI agents to take into account things that are, uh, are really based on stereotyping and stereotypes. And uh, that is including some of the cultural things, looking at the domain, you have to know your domain, and those kinds of things. This is, this is something that, that does not necessarily uh, make an effective uh, uh, law enforcement and intelligence gathering because uh, a lot of the situations you will end up getting uh, bad intelligence if you are going after the group. You are not getting uh, any kind of cooperation between the communities that are vulnerable and they will, see, they will feel that they are under siege. So it is counterproductive in many ways and it also works, uh, um, ends up playing in the hands of those who are uh, aiming to, to, uh, to inflict uh, fear and terrorism among uh, societies and, the, and communities. When, when they see that there is already a, a disconnection and there's no trust between uh, the, the communities and the government that is supposed to, to be able to treat them equally um, and without uh, discrimination. Okay. I think this is one thing where one level in sort of some of the political rhetoric for some EU countries are a little better, and it's actually because they've had a lot longer experience of domestic terrorism. Um, so you've had red terrorism locally in Germany, you've had Basque, ETA, ongoing issues, you've got the Corsicans, there's the Irish, um, there are violent right-wing neo-Nazi groups, there are some strange and quite violent animal activists, and there's a certain amount of rhetoric um, 
I use the term rhetoric advisedly, I think, but sort of saying, no, no, we talk about violent extremists. We don't talk about Muslim terrorists. Um, that said, however, when one goes in and looks at the thrust of policies and, and looks at a lot of the new initiatives that are being undertaken, they are very clearly and strongly targeting Muslims. Um, if you look at the natural number of acts of terrorism, Europol does an annual report which details attempts and acts. There are hundreds every year, um, and almost none of them are Muslim, are, are jihad. I shouldn't use the word jihad, are Al-Qaeda inspired, let's say. Um, but there is, um, and again, of course, because Europe has got a large um, Muslim uh, community, Muslim communities, many, it's the, it's the fastest growing religion in Europe. Um, there is a great deal of concern about this idea of the homegrown terrorist. Um, and the Dutch, because of Teogun Roch being killed by Mohammed Boeri, started very early on with this idea that you could somehow identify people in this process of radicalization. And we describe some of their policies in this book. Um, they came up with these criteria. Uh, which include things very similar to the quote-unquote behavioural profiling, but people suddenly growing beards or refusing to shake hands with women and so on, and were calling on all sorts of social services to report people where they saw these behaviours going on to the authorities to then intervene. They weren't necessarily immediately arrested, but they were sometimes offered counselling and other things. Um, but it's just so obviously targeting certain visible manifestations of religious practice. Um, and just for starters, this is wrong. <laughs> um, they haven't caught anyone through any of these things. And if you look at what's going on in Europe, um, you see a large number of white converts involved in, in those very few acts that have taken place. Um, but you, there's an interesting study also in the Dutch Institute which said, well, yeah, we've looked at identified terrorists, I think they had something like 260 different individuals um, who'd been under suspicion or arrested, I'm not sure what the threshold criteria was to include them. And he said, yes, there's a profile. It's so big, it includes half the Muslim men in Europe. This is completely useless for law enforcement. You are going to waste a vast amount of time and resources that you ought to be using to try to really identify the genuine threats against us. And one critical way, probably the most critical way, you identify those genuine threats is by working with communities. But that does not mean instrument, instrumentalizing those communities and simply seeing them as informants to the police. And this is another one of the problems, I think, with the initiatives that are going on now. A lot of Muslim communities, like the South Asian community, England, has traditionally had a lot of offending rates. They've been very you know, hard-working, good citizens, study that. Now suddenly the police are fascinated by <laughs> South Asian, especially Pakistani word origin citizens in the UK and they're running in and there's a huge program called Prevent is offering money for different kinds of programs. But these communities know exactly why that's all there and going on. And it's a very one-sided dialogue. And although not all of it is necessarily ill intention, you know, it's kind of money for after school programs for kids, that's fine. But it's not being done on the basis of a conversation about who gets it, what gets done, and why suddenly are Muslims, and we just we Muslims in this community getting it. And that can be deeply divisive within local communities in different places. So I really think that in the United States, with the growing concern going on here now, um, in, in the wake of Fort Hood and Jihad Jain and um, so on, uh, the, it's an important time to look at some of these dynamics and some of these discussions coming out of, out of Europe and try to learn some of the lessons and not make the same mistakes. I'm not, frankly, enormously optimistic about that. The NYPD has already put out a big report on radicalization, which is not good. I believe the LAPD proposed to map potential radicalization, which basically meant mapping every mosque and, you know, where the Muslims lived. Uh, that is not the right approach. Um, there needs to be some frankness and some honesty and law enforcement, I think, in these dialogues, if they're going to be good dialogues and they're going to really build trust, they have to be willing to hear criticism. You can't just go in and expect people to inform on you when that community feels victimized, feels 
you know, that they're being pointed at as, as the threat to society when they actually have been living, living suffering the impact of a lot of this targeting. So I think there needs to be some room for a little kind of cathartic outlet in order to get it working. Um, and it, but it does work. I mean, we've talked to communities and we've talked to police um, in areas where they've really engaged with this, and, and information is given. You won't know about it publicly because it's still really difficult within a community to inform on other community members. It's difficult in any community. It's nothing to do with your religion. Um, so on the whole, that's not going to go public unless it has to in a court trial. But information is given, and it's invaluable, and we need it, and we need to create the environment that facilitates it. I was hoping that um, each of you could briefly, I think, just speak to the issue of, of the role that you feel that international um, courts and organizations actually play in this process. I, I find it you know, quite interesting that Ms. Williams, that you, um, in a sense, didn't give up um, once you received um, uh, repeated, um, in a sense, uh, uh, feedback that, that um, you know, that your claim was, you know, that innocence was justified within Spain. And I also find it interesting that, um, I think, um, uh, Rachel Neely and Jamil as well, that you all have attempted to, I think, access different um, international organizations, well, whether that's the EU, whether it's the United Nations, whether it's the um, the OSCE, et cetera, and, and in a sense, what it is you, you feel that you're able to gain within these international spaces and how you feel that translates back to, um, the specific countries that you're working in, and if we can start with Ms. Williams. So. I think the most important thing is um, communication on one level, communication among the different <coughs> organizations that are dealing with this type of uh, situation, and in our case in Spain, we did uh, receive ample coverage in the media. In other words, there were front page uh, articles in the, the Spain's most important newspaper on more than one occasion, television coverage with interviews, et cetera, um, on a national level, et cetera, television and radio. That's one, one, um, one thing I think should be done. Another, and we haven't been able to do it yet, is to advance more to opinion, in other words, in um, more or less mass, uh, massly distributed forums, magazines, etc., that there could be actual in-depth articles that do explain what is happening in different areas of the world, as well as on both sides of the Atlantic, for example. Um, another thing that I mentioned the other day when we had a similar meeting in New York uh, at Open Society was the, the, the importance of education. From my point of view, as a citizen, I, I'm not an expert, as my two colleagues are here, but um, as a citizen, I do believe that it's very, very important for students, uh, starting with children through teenagers, through university, to actually know, learn, um, in this case in Spain, for example, because that's my only experience, to understand the Constitution, what it means, what their privileges are and what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. I think that is very, very important on all levels and constantly. Um, we all, as a, as a major civil liberties and legal organization in the United States, the ACLU, I've, I've always looked at international forums as a complementary uh, uh, forum place to, to raise some of these things that we deeply believe in and concern about policies. We, of course, we would uh, first and foremost uh, pursue the domestic national uh, uh, forums, whether the judicial, whether most of the time litigate, but we also realize that there are certain areas where you, you don't have much success in, in getting a remedy or recourse. To, for the or to change policy, uh, so that you know we we do can, of course engage in the other traditional ways of uh, advocacy, legislative advocacy, and otherwise. But it's also uh, we thought that there's also uh, uh, a benefit in uh, using international forums and in using international human rights framework in particular uh, 
to um, to engage the government, the U.S. government, on, on, on a lot of the issues that where we could, we were not successful in domestic level. So we have been using the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to bring petitions based uh, on behalf of individuals where we exhausted domestic remedies, where the Supreme Court either rejected our uh, lawsuit or our appeal, or uh, for example, on behalf of Khaled al-Masri, um, uh, German national who was victim of rendition program. He filed a lawsuit against the CIA. The lawsuit was uh, dismissed by the lower courts and, and the Supreme Court did not um, uh, grant uh, an appeal, um, uh, and, and therefore the only the only place for him to to get his day in court, to get his uh, himself heard by some sort of a forum, was the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, where the U.S. engages. You, you know, you would you be able to to bring that um, same similar arguments that you made with with sometimes a more advantageous. Uh, uh, Forum because international forums have developed based on the national domestic experiences of different democracies, different uh, legal regimes. So we, we do, do use that as an effective way to inform uh, uh, U.S. government policies on a number of areas uh, where U.S. law is, is, is out of step with the world or behind in terms of providing access to justice, providing legal remedy, or uh, protecting rights and both social, social economic as well as civil political rights. Um, and so we have uh, used international bodies like the United Nations human rights mechanisms when the U.S. was reviewed by those uh, committees to, to, to assess progress that was made under um, the, the international human rights treaties that were ratified by the U.S. So there is a level of uh, commitment, legal, not necessarily always legal commitment, uh, legal obligation, but there's a sense of political, moral obligation to to heed or to to hear uh, the recommendations and to to take them into consideration. And racial profiling certainly is one of those issues that we felt strongly that bringing them to the international uh, forum. Would, would only benefit, uh, we would only benefit, the U.S. government will engage and use that as a way to see what's happening in other countries in Europe, in the OIC region, uh, what's, what's happening in, in the Latin American, in the, in the inter-American system. And that of itself, I think, was, was helpful, both in the individual <coughs> level for uh, individual victims of uh, human rights violations, but also on the broader level of policy making and changing uh, things and, and to it towards better and more effective solutions and workable solutions and you know my colleague mentioned the what we we often use in the human rights community best practices uh, this is really what what are the good positive uh, policies that worked in other countries uh, there's no reason we should not look at that actually the US government engages in all sorts of best practices on, on national security issues diplomatic issues and so on. So similarly, we as a human rights movement, human rights community, would look at good policies where they worked, minimize damage, minimize human rights violations, at the same time, allow the government to, to, uh, uh, to take on an issue and, and to deal with a problem or uh, like terrorism, for example. So it's, it's really been a very important, I must say on a visual level, last year, I maybe traveled mm, the least, uh, um, and there is a feeling that my trips, instead of going to Geneva and to Warsaw and to to uh, to Brussels, I, I was more making the trip from New York to DC, which is a very good sign. And and, and I hope that that will continue. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll put the international when we really don't have any any other option uh, uh, for us here in the United States. Thank you. Okay. I think we covered it. I mean. Governments are really sensitive to international criticism. It is a marvelous opportunity to get attention. <coughs> I do think that international treaties and standards like the CERD express our common values and point to this as not a problem of a particular country, but a shared problem, and hopefully we can look for shared solutions. <coughs> One difference in Europe is that we do have the European Court of Human Rights and its rulings are binding and member states are meant to bring their own legislation and practice into accord with that. And they have three rulings that are relevant to ethnic profiling. We need to bring another direct case that really kind of gets 
even tighter on some of these practices, but there's a body of case law that's interesting and growing. And I would also just close by saying I think that um, as the OSCE National Commission of our Minorities and others already are doing, there's a lot of work that can be done at the international level to bring both law enforcement and civil society together <coughs> Sorry, around positive measures, to have a conversation, not to just feel shamed and defensive and kind of kick back, but to move forward. <coughs> Any closing remarks? Uh, <laughs> and I apologize for having people come to the front that we're, we're also uh, recording this as well. Great. Thank you very much. I did have a few questions. Um, picking up on your last point, I wondered had you given any consideration to pursuing your case through the European Court of Human Rights? given the fact that it does have this binding nature, which Rachel had mentioned. And, and then I wondered, um, a question for the two of you in a certain sense. One is, uh, with the European Union and freer travel, sort of a, no internal border, supposedly, um, I wonder if you, what your experience has been, uh, if you've traveled elsewhere in the European Union and had any, encountered any difficulties. Uh, elsewhere in the European Union, and then I wonder, um, have you uh, have you followed trends as the expansion of the European Union, especially with workers coming from Eastern and Central Europe? To I know there's a large uh, population of construction workers in Portugal and and perhaps elsewhere in Spain and so forth. Uh, in terms of that, those kinds of discriminations and how the EU, to the extent that it is trying to grapple with the fact of discrimination against other individuals from within the European Union. And then I wondered um, if I could raise a question, because you talked about, <coughs> your point, some of your points lead to the question of data. And of course, as the Commission has been instrumental in trying to uh, promote combating anti-Semitism, one of the difficulties that we've inc uh, encountered is the great difficulty in terms of getting anything that comes to accuracy uh, in terms of the data. And, and it strikes me as a little odd too then because you're in a certain sense relying in part, except for praises individuals such as Ms. Williams who come forward and say, you know, I'm not going to go along with this. You're dependent to some extent upon the law enforcement agencies themselves to keep accurate statistics and statistics that do incorporate the types of ethnic background or, or racial background that uh, you're trying to build the case against. I guess just drawing from one personal experience, um, trying to assist a victim of a pickpocketing in Central Europe, uh, this was before the expansion of the European Union, and when I accompany this young woman to uh, the police station, um, the very first question out of the police authorities, and I wonder if you could address this in terms of sort of leading um, and, and sort of already prejudicing what the result might be. Uh, the very first question was, uh, was the person who did the, uh, who uh, picked this woman's purse a, of this background? So mm -hmm. before we got into any of the specifics, they had already concluded that, in all likelihood, uh, Rome was responsible for uh, in, in this particular instance. So I wondered if those are a few issues that had come to mind during the course of your presentations. Um, should I, should I, should I, should I, sorry, I have to leave for the airport. So <coughs> um, the issue with Schengen is, is quite problematic, and particularly with some of the newer sanctioned countries that we don't necessarily enjoy all of the same four protections and we're particularly preoccupied at this time with the treatment of Roma and deportations of Roma back to Romania um, from Italy um, and even Frontex, the European uh, border agency has been involved in deportations that they have publicly recognized now and not been conducted as they should. Schengen includes in Article 6 a specific non-discrimination clause and the question of what that actually means in practice and what kind of training they get is an important one. 
the European Fundamental Rights Agency is meant to be doing joint training with Schengen this year, <coughs> uh, sort of with Frontex, um, but I'm not quite sure what the status of that, or indeed what the approach to the training is, because training can be a whole realm of things with very different effects on actual practice. Just on the law enforcement data, I mean, our problem with profiling is we don't have ethnic data because in the wake of the Second World War, almost no European countries outside the UK will gather any ethnic data. Um, and we don't have law enforcement data because very few countries outside the UK give any law enforcement statistics, they give crime statistics, which include how many immigrants are in prison. Um, so we've, I think that's one of the things our research has sort of helped to do is start to generate this. Um, and we have introduced stop forms and we've gotten law enforcement data through that. Um, there are issues about how that can be manipulated and so on, but um, I think that our stop forms have been reasonably reliable because you do see a lot of disproportionality coming out of them, so if they are manipulating them, they're not doing it as well as they should be. Um, but that said, you can also do surveys and there's some survey data and the fundamental rights agency is doing a little of that. And then if you are really dedicated and get the resources, you can do direct observational studies. And we did one of those in Paris, um, where we benchmarked the population in certain places to have a direct comparison of who was there available to be stopped, which that population looked like in the Paris metro. And then we had observers who followed the police around um, for about four months with cell phones. If you, if you have a piece of paper writing, they stop you. If you have a cell phone and you text, you're completely invisible. Um, and they would text in variables. Um, so we put together the ethnic data on that, and that's where we got a range of disproportion that went up to 14%, 14 times more likely to be stopped in some cases. So you can get the data, um, but it's really resource intensive at the moment, and we need better systematic data gathering um, of ethnic statistics, not personalized data, <coughs> which allows individuals to be tracked, just the statistics to see what's going on um, and how that happens. I think it's something that the law enforcement agencies and the civil rights community in Europe needs to kind of belly up to the table and deal with that one because there's a lot of anxiety and reluctance about it still. The only, the only thing that I would add, I think it was pretty really answered, pretty much answered the questions, and I agree with all of what it was said. Uh, I would just add that even under, uh, there are some states, as you know, have uh, data collection requirement under the state racial profiling uh, uh, act, or ending racial profiling at the state level. And, and this has been instrumental in trying to get information out about the police practices. I know in New York City, NYPD, every, every year, NYCLU uh, receives those, this data and, and analyzes it and, and sees the patterns. And they're still, based on that, they engage with the, with the lo local, uh, with N NYPD in this particular case. Uh, and and even, even when, as you said, you can't completely rely on law enforcement for, for this, but you, you can start with something. Uh, there are also some, some places where Freedom of Information Act uh, requests have also produced a lot of information about police practices, uh, particularly around the local local enforcement of immigration laws, for example. I know in Texas that has been, been particularly uh, instrumental in, in avoiding or when there was a loophole in the Racial Profiling Act in Texas, where, for example, Latino would not be considered as a race, a separate race. So El Paso, which is 80% Latino community, uh, and there was the, uh, the sheriff there was stopping uh, people. It was not considered racial profiling because they were not even considered a different race for that matter, which is absurd to, to look at the, uh, to look at it this way. So there are ways to to go around the manipulation of of, of this. And, and lastly, I would just add the complaint mechanism and oversight. When you have an independent complaint mechanism on police police conduct, law enforcement. Uh, you encourage those kinds of uh, complaints to come forward and ensure that they are going to be receiving the right attention and the, with with uh, independent process of reviewing those complaints rather than depending on the same police to police itself. And I think there was a question about the European Court. Yeah. Um, actually, after the 
case was thrown out of the last court, the Tribunal Court, uh, Constitutional Court in Spain, there were two options. One could have been at that particular time in 2001, the uh, European Court, you know, Human Rights Court. That, you have a deadline of six months to present the case to that court. Therefore, that option is no, wasn't open to me when, when Open Society took it over in 2004, 2004, 2006, they prepared the case, and it's not an option now. And I don't remember your second question for me. The second question was if you've encountered difficulties elsewhere in the European Union, if you travel. No, no, I haven't. I, I travel frequently to France and from time to time Italy, and I haven't. Now, I have in Spain. In other words, in Spain, I haven't been stopped as I was before. Um, but I have been stopped while driving, but not necessarily questioned for a uh, traffic, say, violation or infraction. And at one point, I, we actually did ask the policeman if I were being stopped because of the color of my skin. So, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, not at all. So I but was. But he didn't give another reason. No, no, no. No. So I have been stopped two other times, but this in this case it was not on foot, it was while well, driving the car. So, now, on that note, I will thank everyone for uh, coming and joining us today. I think you um, hear from the panel that this is an issue uh, that um, I think we're going to have to continue to look at and discuss and, and um, look at, I think, actually some common uh, solutions and, and best practices that might actually work in North America as well as abroad and so we actually look forward to continuing that discussion with you and and hopefully we'll be able to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Mrs. Williams back for, for the next conversation so, and so thank you all for participating today thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.